to see the barbarians, the other, as being uh, fundamentally different uh, from uh, the way that you are, and in some ways inferior. But there's also a counterbalancing trend, if you will, uh, in which uh, it's possible for people to, uh, to in a way, change uh, their ethnicity, change their identity, and become part of Greek or Roman civilization. And in the ancient world, um, they tended not to use physical appearance or race, or whatever terms you want to use, uh, as the major indicator of who somebody was, but much more language and culture. And whereas you can't really change your physical appearance very much, uh, you can indeed change the language you speak and the way that you act. And so this gets into the sort of flip side of the coin, which is the ways in which Greek, Roman, and Chinese civilizations were able to absorb and assimilate peoples into, uh, into their populations. And I've got three terms up here uh, that are used to describe in a very rough way these processes. The first one, Hellenization, that is making people to be Greek-like or Greek. And Hellenization is primarily a phenomenon of what we call the Hellenistic period. That is the period after Alexander the Great conquers uh, a huge swath of the known world all the way from the Balkans in Europe to Pakistan. And after his death, while his unified empire breaks up, um, you have a number of large kingdoms and you have a Greek ruling class, Greek kings and Greek administrators and Greek soldiers, uh, but uh, you also have, over time, uh, large numbers of natives who Hellenize, uh, particularly members of the indigenous elites, but also anybody else who's ambitious, who wants to get ahead of the world, who wants to make money to improve their status and so forth. The way to do it, if you are living in one of the Hellenistic kingdoms, is to put on Greek clothing, go to the Greek city, learn to speak the Greek language, and you can eventually become essentially Greek and be part of that, that dominant ethnoclass uh, within the empire. We've talked about Romanization in this half of the course, um, and we connected it in part to the way in which the Roman Empire expanded and ultimately co-opted and assimilated the peoples that it conquered and it used, for instance, citizenship, that it extended citizenship to people that had come under their control as a way of binding them to Rome in shared self-interest. And particularly in the uh, western part of the empire, the Latin language was the sort of chief vehicle for this, and in a place like uh, Roman Gaul, or what we today call France, um, members of the Celtic elite who lived there, or even uh, non-elite people who wanted to get ahead in the world, would go to the city and learn to speak Latin and put on uh, a toga and, and basically act Roman and uh, eventually be sort of accepted as such. Um, they became Roman in the same way that all of us in this room who raised their hands and said that we are descended from relatively recent immigrants have become uh, American. And the process keeps going. And likewise in China as well, and the sort of parallel term that's used is cynicization. Uh, and uh, this is it's hard to see in the Chinese records because the Chinese had this notion that going all the way back into legendary times, China was China, uh, and, and there's a certain kind of static quality to the way on which they, they look at that. Uh, but historians these days are trying more and more to ferret out the reality, which is that um, there were Chinese-speaking people living quite close to other groups of people who haven't left us writing, so we don't know much about them. And over time, uh, because of, in part, the political ascendancy, of Chinese-speaking dynasties, in part because of the attractiveness of Chinese culture, 
that many groups of people became assimilated into, uh, into uh, the Chinese population. And this is not so hard to do if the lifestyle of the other peoples is not so different. And so uh, peoples living uh, near to Chinese-speaking peoples in ancient China were farmers like the Chinese were. So it wasn't so hard for them to uh, adopt Chinese cultural traits, but still maintain their way of life. And that sort of gets at one of the differences, I think, in the story of the um, interactions of the Roman Empire with its barbarians and the Chinese Empire with its barbarians. Um, uh, the Germ Germanic and other peoples living on the borders of the Roman Empire were, for the most part, also farmers and shepherds like ordinary Romans. Uh, in China, you have the somewhat different situation, at least on the northern border, of the nomadic peoples who live on the steppe having very different way of life, uh, different uh, basic economy and so forth. And so it's harder uh, for those people to become assimilated and the sense of otherness uh, is much stronger there. Hopefully you'll see in the chapter for today the sort of basic outline of the last centuries uh, of both the Chinese and the Roman Empire. So I don't want to spend too much time on that. Um, but we sort of left the story in China uh, with uh, Wang Mang's coup uh, in the early first century CE. Uh, and when that uh, when Wang Mang was overthrown and killed, we know that. Uh, the capital of Chang'an was destroyed, and a reconstituted Han Dynasty, uh, the later Han Dynasty, or the Eastern Han Dynasty, took over for another two centuries. Uh, Wang Wu is the first emperor of this uh, restored dynasty. Uh, he was actually uh, a somewhat distant relative of the previous kings before Wang Meng's coup. He came from the eastern part of China, and so he was comfortable moving the capital into the region that he came from, uh, to Luoyang, which is several hundred miles uh, east of Chang'an. And it looks like uh, he and his immediate successors were reasonably competent rulers. But as you move into the later first century CE, you begin to see a kind of insidious dynamic of um, of these uh, dowager empresses and their male relatives, um, when the old emperor dies, using a child as a kind of front, so that the queen uh, and her male relatives who hold the sort of high administrative posts can really be running the country. And we talked about this before, and uh, that there's obviously a certain kind of uh, weakness or vulnerability built into that kind of situation with a, a figurehead king. Um, and uh, going with that is more and more the influence within the court of uh, eunuchs, of men who were castrated so that they could serve in uh, the inner uh, part of the palace in the vicinity of the rulers, many wives and, and female relatives. Uh, and uh, they became very close in a sort of personal way uh, to the rulers. And so you have tension between the eunuchs who are in a way sort of waiting on and serving the royal family and the Confucian scholar administrators who are still in principle supposed to be running the government but often find that the, uh, this inner court is sort of uh, overriding them. So there's a lot of friction there and actually leads in the late second century to a massacre uh, of several thousand eunuchs. But it speaks to the divisions and some of the vulnerabilities within uh, the system uh, of royal rule as it has evolved. And so as we move into the later second century, um, it's very clear, and we read a lot of poems for today from that era, uh, that people feel that things are going a bad way. Uh, 
that there are you know, civil wars, there are uprisings, there are uh, there's all kinds of violence, there are attacks by uh, outsiders, the economy is falling apart, and the uh, optimism that we talked about in the first half of this course has been uh, in large part a kind of characteristic part of the Chinese worldview seems to be replaced by a growing sense of depression and despair and people just watching the world that they knew sort of falling apart right before uh, their eyes. One part of what's going on are, are uprisings in the countryside um, and it's a little hard to figure out exactly what's going on. You, you had one reading for today that had three different excerpts that talked about some of these uprisings and they have sort of curious names like the yellow turbans or the five pecks of grain movement. Um, and, and what makes it hard for us to understand what's going on is that the records we have are written by uh, scholar officials who are connected to the court. Uh, and so they've got, you know, an axe to grind. They are somewhat hostile to these movements. Uh, they're not sympathetic. They don't necessarily understand them or make an effort to understand them. And yet that's what we have to use to try to figure out uh, what's going on. And now we're talking, we've moved from the sort of barbarians and external pressures to what's going on internally within the society and the economy. So the first thing I'd like to do now is to have you look at one of those passages just to see how much we can figure out uh, from these admittedly jaundiced sources about what's going on. So let me see which reader item this is. This is reader uh, item 79, and it's the page right after the uh, cover page, so in the uh, book that we Xerox this from, it's page 83, and for the first story that's on page 83, and the first part of page 84 is the story of Zhang Jue. So I want you to just quickly read this and just tell me what you, can, you think is going on here. Uh, what is is happening out in the countryside, in the provinces, uh, that is perceived as a threat to the uh, to the political system. 